Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about returning cultural objects. I'm Jennifer Thyerson, an object conservator based in Kimmarthenshire. And I'm Chloe Rumsey, an object conservator based in Greater Manchester. Welcome to the show, everyone. Hi, everyone. Today we've actually got two guest hosts, which is extra special. I, I know, right? Would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Hello, I'm Jeremy Uden. I'm Head of Conservation at the Pitt Rivers Museum. I'm Marina de Alican. I'm Curator and Joint Head of Collections at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Welcome both of you. This is very strange because we're all at distance, which is very unusual for us, but COVID times. Yes, indeed. However, the wonders of technology has brought us all together. So there is that. It's beautiful. So today we're talking about returning cultural objects. And I say that because I remember I had a flashback to when I was standing in, in, in my old workplace and uh, I was talking about repatriation and someone else said restitution and I started having a crisis about which one it was. <laughs> and like there are definitions for this, but uh, I just thought, well, you know, well, we're talking about returning cultural objects which is kind of the core of the episode. But I just thought for anyone else who's having a similar kind of cold sweat of, am I 5 million years old? Have I missed an update? Have I missed a software update? Is there something I should be knowing? Then the definition that the Collections Trust has is restitution is the process by which cultural objects are returned to an individual or community. And repatriation is the process by which cultural objects are returned to a nation or state at the request of a government. And then I'm sure there's like, a spectrum here of like all sorts of wonderful words that we use for returning cultural objects but just as a slight grounding that's what that is i I just really look forward to kind of unboxing this topic because it's it's very topical so i was looking at the articles for this and reminding myself when we were seeing so much kind of public press about it and all of the articles pretty much that i found were written at the back end of 2019 Mm. And one in particular used the phrase that made me sort of smile wistfully. Um, It's an international conversation with no sign of stopping. And this was in December 2019. And I just think, oh, they had no idea that something would get in the way so completely. However, it is quite a new focus in the public eye. But we've been aware of it, obviously, for years and years. So I think that's interesting that you say that because I've got another article in front of me and that says that this was published in January, so but the before time still. <laughs> and it basically said that over the past 18 months, the repatriation debate has, has really kicked off. So I suppose it's like two years of more intense, not scrutiny, but more, I feel like it, it has been more intense in the past two years. So I think, I think that's a good time frame. But obviously it was talked about before then. But I was thinking back on, in my first degree, when we had like a lecture on repatriation and similar issues, <laughs> I mean, this is more than 10 years ago, you know, so it's it's a while ago. And I remember then the kind of attitude, I suppose, seemed to have been, well, ultimately, it's probably a good thing, but it's not done very much. And the times when it's done a lot is when it's like looted things stolen during the war. Like, you know, it's like, if the Nazis stole something, it's basically fair game. Anything else is a bit hard and we don't really do it. And that is my like lasting impression of that up until this point where people became a bit woke and kind of went, Oh, yeah, that's a good thing. Yes, finally. <laughs> so we're really lucky to be speaking to the Pit Rivers, um, obviously. So thank you so much for joining us. And I feel that we're particularly lucky because this is a topic that has been relevant to you for much longer than the sort of 2019. The Pit Rivers Museum, I think we returned, we did our first returns case, and we use returns now. We did our first return, I think, in 1992 or 1993, and it was a return of several Australian Aboriginal human remains. By the way, that's also how I feel like that was the example that came up in the lecture. You know, it was return of Aboriginal remains. And it it may or may not have, have been from your collection, but it was definitely like the example that was being held up as but it is done look at it and and i think that's interesting that that's kind of that's kind of the core first example in some ways yeah i think it was not without its its problems and in fact sort of it's interesting what you were saying when you were when you were doing your degree because it seems to i remember around that time and and even now it's a hot topic for people's dissertations um Mm. but actually a colleague of of mine and of, of jeremy's did her dissertation 
on what had happened to these human remains in Australia after they were handed over to the Australian High Commission in London. What happened really has informed what we try and do now. What Um, did happen? With some of the information, it really wasn't, you know, the information just wasn't there. But she contacted different land councils. And actually, there was one land council, and I cannot remember which which one it was, and I apologise. But the, basically, I think they had been sent by the High Commission. They were sent a human remain in a cardboard box with no warning, with nothing on it that said oh, wow. that it was from this particular cultural group. And that this is a gross cultural offence, and that this matter... Would really had really not been handled well, so now we we really are one of our main kind of thrusts is making sure that actually things are done with the agreement and the wishes of the communities involved. God, that actually gave me goosebumps. Like that's just, I mean, the thing is that mistakes happen and we all need to learn from them. And it sounds like there are really early did. days of everything. Aren't yeah, there? exactly. And it sounds like all really took that to heart and went, well, that can't happen again. Let's let's move forward. Yeah, I think it's I think it's tricky though because we take the view that once an object whatever the object is whether it's an ancestral remain or whether it's a a cultural object is returned that the museum does not have any kind of say or control over what happens to it so whether it's destroyed buried sent to a museum that is not our call and actually I think the museum director at the time was acting on the as well as he could, he returned the material to the Australian High Commission as requested. It was what happened afterwards. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up that you're not involved with what happens afterwards. Because I feel like that's an argument I've seen thrown about in a kind of controversial way where it's like, oh, well, we don't know what happens afterwards. Yes, but that's because it's... <laughs> I, I always <laughs> want to go, that's none of your business. Like, it's it's returned. It's... I mean, I think it gives people, a lot of people, the heebie-jeebies. It's the fact Mm -hmm. that you are essentially saying it's not ours anymore. Mm -hmm. We really don't have the right to comment. And a lot of the questions that we get, because not everyone is pro-return, a lot of the questions we get are along the lines of, but but what, well, I mean, it'll just be buried. It'll be lost to science. That is the kind of arguments that you see bandied about. And uh, it, it is interesting, as you say, that not everyone is pro-return. And I guess that's why well, we're even having this as, as an episode topic. It's We're trying to talk about a, a topic that's actually quite difficult for the museum community and the heritage community. What are the other yeah. reasons that people get the heebie-jeebies? Do we have a sort of collection of attitudes that we've come across, do you think? So I think there is a huge group of people who think the floodgates will open. There'll be nothing. Floodgates is a word, a phrase (laughs) that I wrote down, actually. Is it the floodgates? No, there's nothing left. You know, you might as well just be holding a rummage sale and invite everyone along. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's what happens, isn't it? (laughs) I think there are also instances where, um, which are even more, I don't know, they give me the heebie-jeebies much more about where because quite often with a returns request you get you you return associated information and documentation so we don't return original um, accession volumes because they have other information in them that we need but actually anything we have on those objects would also be returned Mm. but I have heard of institutions where returning human remains they have kept a tooth from every skull to in case they need to do future research. Oh. How do you feel about that? I suppose from conservation and curatorial, because I, I, I got the sort of shivers just hearing that, but I don't know why. Well, I think you would have to have incredibly strong justification to want to take a sample from a human remain before returning it. Mm. I'm not entirely sure what that justification would be, to be honest. Yeah, I I agree. We wouldn't do any testing or or sampling of human remains without community consultation anyway. Mm. Okay. Very unlikely that a community. That's not just human remains, is it? You know, any kind of culturally important object, if someone wants to take a sample and do destructive analysis on it, we would try and get an opinion from the originating community and often they agree as long as the information is shared with them but sometimes they don't want it to happen in which case it doesn't happen yeah 
That's that's good that you have those relationships. That's really good. Yeah. I'm going to say that there are situations actually where that potentially could help enormously. So we have been working with an osteologist to look at our human remains to potentially identify where some material comes from in the world. And there are some, because of the haziness of museum documentations, we do have some human remains where it says, you know, question mark Australia, question mark North America. Yeah. Now, we have gone back to communities who we were, are working with and said, what do we do about this? You know, the only way that we could probably, you know, would be to do some further sampling or, or something. And, and they've been very much, no, we'll just exclude that from any request list. Oh, interesting. OK. I've not been directly involved in, in returning any kind of object, but I certainly had the kind of discussions when there was World Cultures materials involved. And again, because of the hastiness of museum documentation, it, as you say, it, it can be difficult to know anything for sure. And sometimes it's a case of, well, obviously it's not human remains, it's cultural objects, but it can be hard to ascertain whether something is kind of tourist tat, but Victorian, and it was sold to rich foreigners who had more money than sense, or whether something is truly a cultural object that was that should never have left that place, for example. I suppose my comment on that is it's not up to us to decide what a culturally yeah. important object is. It's up to the originating yeah, community. Yeah. You know, it's, mm. not, it's not up to us to make that decision or to yeah. have an opinion about it, really. No, that's true. It's a really, really good point. And I, I suppose then it becomes a thing of, of relationship building where you need to start having those conversations with people and f trying to find out who those who those source communities are. I mean, I think there's also the issue that a lot of people think of cultural objects as very much a celebration of indigenous relationships rather than as markers of any kind of colonial oppression or past wrongs. And I think... Yeah. I think a lot sort of hangs on. Museums are friendly places. They're family mm. friendly. We talk a lot about family friendly and having a nice coffee shop and a trail. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't think we like to think of them as places that, you know, are involved in the subjugation of indigenous peoples. Yeah. You know, quite a lot of the objects that, you know, we might feel comfortable with by saying, oh, you know, that was bought so it was a legitimate trade when the descendants of those people who sold those objects know that they're in the museum and say you know well they were sold illegally or mm, yeah you know that was that was a result of you know an, an, an unequal relationship of power and they were coerced into selling and I think you know there's a lot more to it than meets the eye really absolutely and I guess that's that's another kind of discussion that we started having was that okay well let's say that this was something that was bought what some people would phrase legitimately okay there was an exchange of money but where did that object come from was it still okay there's so much more to a transaction and like it just because you paid for something doesn't make it right but i think also you have to look at i mean this is where provenance research is so important but you also have to look at things like you know whether it was at a time of drought you know, you. I would be much more likely to sell something that I possibly didn't even have the right to sell. Yeah. If I needed to feed my family. Yeah. And that was the only way of doing it. You know, I think, and that is an unequal and an unfair relationship. Exactly. So I just wrote down on my notepad store work because I'm aware of some pretty large store work projects um, that you're done at the Pitt Rivers and also other similar museums in the UK. Obviously, the funding goes into this for the store work itself. Have you had experience of potential returns issues or projects coming out of that? And how does that work with funding and time? Uh, I think, um, yeah, we have had a, a lot of major store projects. Some of them are to do with cataloguing objects mm -hmm. in store. We're now starting to find that some people who are potential funders are more interested in us working with originating communities to describe oh, objects wow. than just to fund a storage or cataloguing project. So, you know, we are kind of piloting ways, new ways of working, really, where we can actually, you know, say to an originating community, what's the important thing for you for us to document about this object? You know, what do you want us to record rather than just, you know, doing a straightforward museum cataloguing job? Mm. And, you know, as I say, some funders are actively saying that they want us to work in that way. And that is the only way that they, we will get the funding if we can show that we're doing that. 
Oh, wow. We are also looking much more towards cultural kind of custodianship in that. So sort of talking to communities about how they would like material to be stored, what kind of access we give to material if somebody's doing a research project or wants to do a research project in this on particular set of objects that they perhaps could contact the community first to to get community approval so what would your um what would you say would be your advice then to smaller museums who um are looking at their collections thinking we may have an issue here but they are you know a staff of two i think for me it would be to do an audit of your human remains but I would say also, you know, start. Yeah. At, at some point, you've got to make a start, you know, even if it's just an hour a week. I mean, we were in the position before we got funding from the university where, you know, we were trying to get through our store by working one day a week, you know, a team of two or three of us. And, you know, over the years, we did make progress, although obviously, you know, with the funding that we got, we were able to finish the whole store in 18 months. But, you know, wow. at, least we'd, at least we'd made a start, you know. Also, I would say ask for help. Ask for ask for help with identifications. There are lots of subject specialist networks. Mm. Um, you know, things like the Museum Ethnographers Group. Um, I, I think that, and ask what other people are doing. You don't have to completely rewrite your different policies on this, that and the other ask for other people's yeah that's a really good point has anything sprung to mind with either of you of things you'd like to add or topics you'd like to bring up uh well i suppose from the conservation point of view there are some issues about returning objects that are potentially contaminated with pesticides Mm. yeah i'm glad you brought that up (laughs) we've done research in the pit rivers on our cook voyage collections and we know that we have everything you can think of on our collections starting with mercury and arsenic and ending up with dieldrin lindane ddt great that definitely in my mind gives us at least a moral responsibility to let people know both when they come to the museum and want to handle collections and you know maybe try a mask on, on up to their face or try a cloak on and things like that we definitely you know we don't we i want to say allow but the word isn't allow you know that's that's fine when people visit and they make those requests we we always agree to them unless the object is really fragile they facilitate that exactly yeah you know our job is not to you know we're not those type of conservators at the pit rivers that don't want people handling the objects and we don't equate handling with damage and you know we recognize that well the objects in our care are we look after them they they may have another another story beyond the museum and we have to think about that at some point. So I think we have at least a moral responsibility, all of us, to be able to say to people, "Our oh, the objects in our collection may damage you if you come into close contact with them. And at least give people the choice. You know, you can say to them, we know that our collections are contaminated. If you still want to try this mask on, that's fine. But make sure you, you know, wash your hands and face afterwards or whatever. Mm. So I think... There are other issues to consider when we're thinking about returning objects. And obviously in America, they're a bit further ahead of us with NAGPRA. Yeah. But I think it is something that we obviously have to consider in this country too. That's a very good point that you need to be able to allow people to make an informed decision about the risks. That's that's a good well, point. Exactly. And sometimes, you know, we have visits and we say our collections are contaminated. You know, this is historical contam- contamination. Mm. You, know, you can't blame people because they thought that, you know, they were doing what was right at the time to preserve the collection. And yeah. quite honestly, that's why a lot of these objects are still here is that they're so heavily contaminated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, exactly. You know, at least then, you know, sometimes an elder will say, say right I'm making a decision that no woman of childbearing age is going to handle any of these objects without gloves on Mm. you know at least it's an informed decision and is that often the response you get then that people go okay well we'll we'll compromise I mean sometimes it is and sometimes people are quite happy to just wash their hands because you know we Mm -hmm. say to them they are contaminated but they're microscopic amounts you know just make sure you wash your hands afterwards but at least, you know, people do have the choice to, you know, decide not to touch an object or to wear gloves. Yeah. But you... when these things are returned to the community, it's really important to make sure that people also have that information and it's not lost somewhere. Mm. But I think it's also that we 
there are lots of different types of returns and and this is one of the areas that i think is going to become increasingly complex is is it museum to museum return is it state to state mm-hmm. and and those will all have different results in terms of kind of handling and information being lost as jeremy says Mm. I think it's interesting that you mentioned um, NAGPRA and I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about them. But also this is so weighted in the history of the country that has taken the things and our history is so different between us and the US. But I I think our our museum history is quite similar. And obviously, you know, things that started happening in the 1820s when the first um, mercury soaps were used to preserve animal skins and then organic Uh, objects. Of course. You know, those things pretty quickly spread to museums worldwide, you know, and certainly in Europe and America. Mm, good point. So I think, you know, that the legacy of pesticide use, you know, does go back 200 years. There's not a massive amount to say about NAGPRA, really, except it does involve lots of community consultation. I think it's important that within NAGPRA, specific groups are asked what level of testing they would like to happen on those objects and actually it's, it's, a, it's a really consultative process as to you know what happens what happens to the objects if they're discovered to be contaminated what is going to happen to the object once it's returned is it just going to be left to decay as some things are um, in which case is there potential environmental contamination of you know um, particular lands which obviously oh, of course what it isn't a good thing. People want to avoid that. But I think the logical next step is to look at how to decontaminate objects. And I think that is something that isn't particularly being looked into at the moment. I know there's some research being done on supercritical carbon dioxide. Oh, wow. Um, how widespread that can be, I'm not sure, given that that's a quite industrial process and the equipment is very expensive. But, you know, there are potentially ways of decontaminating objects. You know, I'm not even sure that I've read in the literature how, if anyone has discovered, you know, how effective vacuum cleaning with a HEPA filter might be to remove particulate or heavy metal contamination. Mm. I think the problem is that people don't really know what's on their collections or if they do know what's on their collections, whether it's actually harmful to health. And that's something that we're trying to get funding for at the Pit Rivers is to, you know, we know we've done the testing. We know that we've got all these pesticides on our collection. What does that mean? You know, if we as museum professionals are around those collections for 30 years, are they going to make us sick or are we actually going to be fine because the amounts are so minuscule? So, you know, I think it's potentially a bit of an issue, but it'd be really nice to find out how much of an issue and whether it is actually damaging both to people who may use those objects once they've been returned and to us who work with those objects every day. Um, And for anyone who has not heard of NAGPRA, um, it's the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. Indeed. That if we're talking about repatriation is starting in the 90s might have been one of the real big movements towards this. Mm. I mean, I think for us at the Pitt Rivers, the impact of NAGPRA is that we, there is a network of people we can contact who we know have a repatriation remit. So yeah. it means that when we start looking at our North American collections, that we can contact NAGPRA officers. I think there is an existing claim that is through a NAGPRA office. But it's also, I think it's slightly confusing because... Some communities, particularly North American communities, expect NAGPRA to be a global thing, and it's not. You know, there's no legal obligation in, in the UK. Yeah. Yeah, so the, there are kind of pocket dimensions out there of, you know, good work being done, but it doesn't necessarily have an, have much international clout, I suppose. But, you know, if, at least if you're talking to people who know their stuff and who work with this sort of stuff a lot, at least that's you've got to start having the dialogues, right? Even if you might then find that there's no funding pots for you to be able to facilitate a visit or send something off, you know, you at least you can start by talking to people. And I think that's good because there's an enormous amount of, you know, know-how out there. It's also the case that we recently, the, the museum, t- took the decision to remove the human remains from display. Yeah. And that was yes, I read wi- that. widely publicized mm. but as, along with the how can you possibly do this it's a floodgate well um, <laughs> there were, it was, 
we people also reached out to us about areas of the collection that that they could help you know with us contacting originating communities and setting up delegations so actually there has been a huge positive effect of that oh that's fantastic i'm just really glad to hear that there are people who have been positive and supportive that's really really good yeah it's great to hear as well that it your sort of fame as a museum i suppose has allowed you to act as a kind of a beacon i suppose for other projects like this and and to um kind of be the advertisers of look we can do it right that's really good it kind of gives other people hope i think exactly yeah so obviously everything we've been talking about so far has been quite a lot of either institutional led or cultural group led mm-hmm. but there's been a lot when we were looking at the um when we we're hearing about this in the news there's been a lot of stories of campaign groups and sort of pressure put on to museums from outside either of the two sides mm. and not just museums like there was um student organizations at mm. universities that sort of thing as well because uh, i think that's what uh uh, led to the was it the University of Cambridge who was going to return the bronze yes, cockle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, th- I do believe that was like student led, for example. That there, there was a lot of protests and stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, twenty twenty has certainly been a, a very significant year for let's say social unrest and people being fed up with injustice. And mm. there's been a lot of social awareness in t- in social justice kind of sense. Definitely been a year of campaigns and stuff like that as well so it's it's been fascinating to watch and i think that is another thing that's just driving these sorts of changes and that museums are kind of going oh hang on we probably have to deal with this the important thing is just to be open and, and mm. open to conversation and discussion and saying come in let's talk about this mm. let's let's get this on the table let's you know let's see what what works for people i mean I personally feel very much a responsibility to the objects whilst they are in my kind of stewardship. So I I am looking after them for kind of for the communities. It's sort of how, how I feel about it personally. So for me, it's probably more to do with originating communities and local diaspora groups. But... I don't know how Jeremy feels, and I, I. But I think an awful lot is being willing to have the conversations and not being scared. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think you've got to be open to the conversation. And our director certainly addressed the Black Lives Matters protest in Oxford when when there was a, a demonstration outside the museum, um, and she talked to the group about what the museum was doing in terms of you know returns and um, decolonization so yeah I think it is really important to have you know I hate the term you know difficult conversations <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day they're just conversations you know, yeah. there might be a topics that you feel a bit uncomfortable with but you know they are just conversations and at least if you're talking to somebody then you know there is a dialogue and you're sharing ideas and information I like that you use the word stewardship because I feel like kind of repatriation d- discussions tend to use the word ownership a lot as museums that own things rather than phrasing it as stewardship. And I, I think that's a really important difference in how you think about the objects that are in your care. I think all of us are really clear at the Pit Rivers that we do you know, have a stewardship role over the collections. The objects also- may not be in the collection in the future yeah you know our our job is to look after them for the time that they're in oxford and you know make sure that they can be passed on if that's what's going to happen to them yeah also the pit rivers doesn't actually own them they're owned by the university of oxford um on a very well also a lot are on loan but but i think we definitely feel you know uh, uh an originating community visit can be a potentially very uncomfortable and very emotional thing and i think we as staff at the museum we feel that we, it's really important to acknowledge that and and there is an emotional burden on all of us but that i think it's important to acknowledge that whilst you can feel someone's pain you can feel for someone, you don't feel their pain or mm. their what they are feeling when they are encountering those objects. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is incredibly emotional. Um, I think we've all been, you know, moved to tears by people's responses to objects which sometimes they consider to be, you know, the embodiment of their ancestors or when they feel that connection between, you know, an object and the people who made it. And it's just an incredibly emotional experience. And I think it's those kinds of experiences that, you know, make us all realise the power that these objects have. I think those are those kinds of experiences are all the experiences that remind us why we did it, why we got into this game in the first place. A few years ago, the museum repatriated several human remains to New Zealand, and um, we requested that the move team staff were able to attend the repatriation ceremony. And these are a group of young people in their first or maybe second job at the most in museums, working in the stores day in, day out, being made to tank through thousands and thousands (laughs) of objects, being told to treat every single one with respect as if it's the most important thing in the world. But I have to say that the day after attending that ceremony, they were different. Oh, wow. Wow. It was a really powerful ceremony, wasn't it? You know, I was in the procession bringing the human remains into the room where the ceremony was going to happen. And it was incredibly emotional. And, you know, even someone as jaded and cynical as I am (laughs) felt that emotion, you know, and was, you know, it was a real privilege to be part of it often couched in terms of what's lost like oh well we won't have them on display or they won't be there for research but very few people talk about what's gained like the experiences and the the dialogue and the relationship and the fact that you're giving something back to someone as well well exactly all that you know a repatriation can lead to a much closer relationship between communities you know people always say to us well what would happen if you repatriated the hyder totem pole which is kind of the symbol of the pit rivers you think well you know maybe you could see a scenario where we got a a, a carver to make us a new totem pole yeah and what a great new relationship that would be yeah and what a way of displaying you know a, a vital craft skill that's so endangered you know how amazing would that be we would really welcome an ongoing relationship and that's quite hard to manage with staff turnover and things like that but we at the museum would absolutely welcome that but we can't have it as a given as a as an as a requirement because actually sometimes it it could be that that actually i want nothing more to do with that awful place that reminds me of awful things that happened that it really depends but one thing we have been talking about is possibly having something if we if funding were no issue i love the idea of possibly commissioning an indigenous artist from the community that we're returning to to create something in the museum that could represent almost the scar of the yeah. object yeah that that i think that's beautiful i think that would be really beautiful so so when we think of people as being against repatriation or return of collections, I think there is a tendency to assume that those people are not from Indigenous backgrounds. And actually, it, it's not always the case that Indigenous peoples want their objects back. Some people are very happy for collections to, to remain in other museums, you know, in museums around the world, almost as kind of cultural ambassadors. But I think it's giving people that choice and it's giving people, the empowering people to say what they want to be said about them. Absolutely. That's a really good point. And it's something that I think when, when people first started talking about repatriation and stuff, I, I think initially, I think I had that feeling of, does that mean that, we, that we're going to go towards that heavily almost nationalistic and puritan kind of museum world where you only have things from the culture that you are literally in in the museum but it wasn't about that and i think what i was feeling because i'm an immigrant was that what do are, is there no place for things from other parts of the world in museums and i think there can be definitely and very much as cultural ambassadors but it's about there being the choice and it being deliberate and it being a negotiation and a relationship and a willingness not for it to be looted stuff or context is everything and it has to be done with meaning 
And it's also not about giving things back automatically as a way of, there you go, you have it all back now. We've never done anything bad and we'll we <laughs> forget about the entire thing. It's not about that either. It's neither of those things are, are, are really true. It's about all these relationships and that there's it all needs to be a consenting relationship. Well, exactly. It's about asking the community how they want to be represented. Exactly. And working collaboratively. And not just our museum voice being represented. Yeah, I, th- I think it's all about that. It's all about the dialogue. And it's, I think uh, it's also whose voice are you are, are you seeing when you read a label? Yeah, an attitude I encountered is one of, well, this doesn't have anything to do with us, so we'll just give it back. Or a kind of rationalisation of, well, we have too much stuff anyway, we'll just give the stuff back. That's not really what it should be about. It shouldn't be... Ah, the big Western collections, they have too much stuff and now they, they, they're done with these bits. You may have them back. That's completely the wrong attitude to have towards this. I did read an interesting um, uh, bit of an article earlier that that just has the phrase, notably just 1% of the British Museum, for example's collection is on display. And that's an attitude of, I think, museums that we're probably all quite familiar with in the media that have, uh, what do you mean you don't have everything on display? Isn't that a waste? It's the it's the right attitude to possibly rationalisation, but it, <laughs> th- those you know those two aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, and and I think I'm just I just want people to like not treat this as a ah oh, we may as well dispose of this. It's not about that. It, you know, it's about the relationship. It's not actually up to us to decide what needs to be repatriated or exactly. returned. Yeah, contemporary collecting I think goes hand in hand with returns. Yeah, because. Actually, you can say a lot more about new relationships and in different ways with, with new objects. I love the idea that actually we can we can change things. I think we have this in this country, it seems to me we have a very our idea of heritage is really fixed. It's it's fixed to the material. And I think repatriation and return feel like a, a kind of threat to heritage as a whole to some people. Mm. And, I, you know, I suppose it's also the type of institution that you work in. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, in Oxford, we are the museums, you know, the university's museum of ethnography. There is a Western art museum. We both have Egyptian collections, including Egyptian mummies. Mm. You know, I think the way that those objects are viewed within the two institutions possibly is quite different. Mm. You know, and we are open to the idea of repatriating Egyptian mummies as human remains and of removing them from display. Other opinions may vary. I'm mildly annoyed that I haven't been able to uh, find much on like the role of conservators in, in literature, if you see what I mean. But there hasn't been an awful lot written about repatriation and conservators. Well, I know it's, it's difficult because, you know, kind of what we do as conservators in terms of looking after objects and making sure that they're stored properly and, you know, making sure that they're stable... I think that's all something that's assumed when an object is returned that we've actually been looking after it in the meantime. Yeah, I mean, I I suppose, yeah, but I really liked your angle of, you know, like it's it's also about the, you know, not to say that with the health and safety police again, but, you know, just like making people aware of those risks as well. And and yes, the, the, the conservatives, they are very much kind of in the museum world and in the heritage world and they aren't necessarily out in the communities and that like the the stewardship of of that is then passed passed back on to those those groups and and that's of course the way it should be i mean we we have as conservators worked with originating communities and yeah you know ask them on particular objects what they think we should do yeah you know, one of the things that's like is our blackfoot shirts project where we work with a blackfoot elder the shirts were very dirty because they were nailed up in the collector's house and had got soot all over them. You know, we said to him, how do you want these to look as a Blackfoot elder? And he basically said, I want them cleaned. I want them looking the best that they possibly can to represent our culture. You know, so we do have those kinds of interactions. I suppose the question of what ongoing relationship you might have with a community and with objects once they've been repatriated, you know, once again, that's not our choice. Yeah. You know, if we're asked to help, then we obviously will. Yeah. If we're not, you know, we're not going to kind of pressurise people to feel that those relationships are necessary in order for the return to happen. No, of course. And of course, you know, as as you, you both brought up, is that sometimes the museum can very much be a, 
not an enemy as such, but you know, it's a representation of you know a lot of pain, for example. And the the everyone is completely within their rights to go. Okay, we're done now. Thanks. We're not gonna yeah. we're not gonna keep in touch. <laughs> you know, that's absolutely fine because everyone has to heal in their own way, and and some things you know take time. I think also. Um, conservatives have such a key role when it comes to preparing for community visits. Those, you know, as conservatives, we have tried to work on every object that an originating community sees. We remove museum labels. Yeah. Uh, you know, we actually prepare the objects so that they look, you know, they are the best that they can be when they're seen by the community. Yeah. Because that's, you know, a sign of respect, the fact that we respect yeah. the objects, we respect the community who are visiting. You know, I think to get objects out of storage and present them to a community without going through that conservation process and cleaning them and, you know, all those other things is is a sign of disrespect, frankly. Mm, yeah. And also, I think it's really important to think about how a community approaches those collections. So at the museum, we have a, a visiting researcher's space, but it's sort of slightly fishbowlish. We have the collections office, we have the conservation lab. And actually to think about, are there going to be people walking past? Mm. Um, are people going to be walking into a room to be smacked in the face by an object that they considered to be enormously powerful, potentially dangerous, mm-hmm. that actually, how do people want to approach that? And working with conservation colleagues, that's that's really key for that. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing to include, actually, the, the, the sort of actual on the ground of how would one manage a guest coming in to view an object? What would that look like? Because you wouldn't just bung it in a room and say, there you go. I'm going to stand here now staring at you. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we have made mistakes and have exposed community members to objects which have been incredibly powerful. And, you know, it's caused a lot of emotion. And, you know, that is because we didn't know enough about the object and mm. what it mm. was and so what its significance was to that community. So we are really aware of the impact that actually, you know, seeing these objects for the first time especially when they are, you know, spiritually powerful, we know what that impact can be. It's also that we we now will ask in advance, you know, are there any particular things that you need or, you know, do you need, for example, I don't know, do you need us to turn the fire alarms off? Might you want, do you want quiet space? Do you, would you rather have no one in the room? Would you like the material covered as you enter the room? Do you need hand washing facilities? Do you know a range of anything? Yeah, yeah. we will try and do. Like, you know, sometimes you know, as conservators working on objects, the member of the community is asked to bless us first, or you know, they want to bless the whole group before we uncover the object. Mm. You know, it's in you know spiritual things rather than just physical yeah. things. That's really interesting, and what a wonderful way to collaborate. I like that. I mean, yes, conservatives are traditionally seen as people who don't want anything to be touched and don't want anything to be seen and just wanted to hold boxed away and stuff like that and last forever and sit in the museum. But actually, we do have this conversation every now and then that actually what we try to look after is is something's is something's value and that 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 value is necessarily defined by us. And exactly, that, and you, you just cannot be that kind of conservator. Yeah. When someone requests that you know they try a mask on or whatever, your role is to you know remind say that yes, but it's covered in pesticides, so make sure you wash your face. Yeah. It's not to say no, I don't want you to do that in case you drop it. Or you know we've had requests from communities to use museum objects in dance performances and yeah. in ceremonies, and our role is to facilitate that. It's not to say no yeah it's to work out how we can make it happen thank you both so much for joining us today it's been a really fascinating discussion thank you thank you for inviting us yeah thank you for having us so we've also got an interview that I feel like I did ages ago. It was back in May with Mark Vaness from the John Rylands Library. Um, and we're talking a bit about his role as a conservator in a project to repatriate some objects um, as part of a, a recent repatriation project at Manchester Museum. Mm.
So I'm here today with Mark Finesse, who's kindly agreed to talk to us about a project he's been involved in the last couple of months. So Mark, would you like to introduce yourself um, and talk a bit about the project you were involved in? Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Finesse. I'm Senior Conservator and External Loans Coordinator at the University of Manchester Library. And towards the end of last year and early this year, I was involved with a project on behalf of Manchester University Museum or Manchester Museum to return 43 Aboriginal objects to Australia and to the nations and the peoples that they, they originally came from. That must have been a really interesting project. And was it one that you were borrowed for? Uh, yeah, so the Manchester Museum and Manchester Library uh, University Library are all part of the same the University of Manchester and I was approached mostly because I although I'm a conservator and I have hand skills because I'm a man the actual objects that were being repatriated were considered secret sacred man's business is, is the terminology that was being used and as a step towards cultural sensitivity it was deemed that a man working on these objects would be more preferable than a woman obviously i'm not a native australian man so just kind of one step towards being uh, as culturally sensitive as we could so as a book and paper specialist it must have been quite strange to be requested to work on something that was slightly out of your specialism uh, yeah especially as the main kind of reasoning was my gender. I mean, also, the person that contacted me was Gillian Smithson, who's the registrar at the museum, and I've worked with her before, and my work on loans, I was in some ways more familiar with stuff leaving the country, being packed for international shipping. So there was that background relationship already there. And in terms of um, being a book and paper conservator, working with these objects, it just kind of was back to the kind of basics, mm. consulted with my colleagues when I didn't know what exactly the risks were, but it was very very much minimal interventions mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, there were kind of conceptual differences, like the future use of the object, cultural handling. Mm. It's it's a developing thing. So what was it you were, what were the objects as much as you can say? And what were you sort of required to do? What were you unfamiliar with? And what did you find that you were comfortable working with? Uh, well, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go through the process as much as I, I knew and then we'll get to the objects within yeah. that. So there's an independent Australian government statutory authority, is wow. what it's called, this group called IATSIS, Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. And they're an authority in engagement with the Indigenous peoples of Australia, a source of language and cultural revitalisation and kind of ethical research and handling of culturally sensitive material. They're, 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 that's kind of what they do. And they started up a project uh, called the Return of Cultural Heritage Project. As part of that project, they identified 200 or so institutions uh, around the world that, that they identified as holding uh, Aboriginal wow. and Torres Strait Island cultural heritage that is collections. That's a lot. It is, and um, I think it counted for about 95,000 oh, plus God. objects. Yeah, wow. And so of those 200 plus institutions, they put out requests for information about what those objects were. And of those 200 plus, about 91 institutions shared information on what they had. 48 were eager to kind of establish a relationship and 34 expressed an actual interest to return the items. And Manchester Museum was one of those. Manchester had 43 objects, 22 for the Aranda people, 12 for the Gangalida Gawara people, six for the Nyamal, and three for the Yawuru people. As preparation for these 43 objects going, the request that kind of came through was uh, that we use standard archival packaging that had been agreed as being all right to be put in contact with these objects. Is that based on sort of um, potential additional components? Yeah, I think it's, it's that kind of... I, I'm not sure if it was the instance in this case, but I know that some Sometimes they don't want unnatural ah, materials right. to be in contact. So we, we just did on the side of the caution anyway mm -hmm. and using acid-free tissue. Mm -hmm. And we used the historical archival boxes that they were. That I wouldn't necessarily say they were archival, but they were kind of tied to the history of it. Yeah. As I was saying before, th these were objects that were deemed secret, sacred man's mm -hmm. business. Now, not every part of that means that they were completely secret or you can really talk about them. I, I generally tend not to because, for one, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth and say completely spurious things about what they are. So some of the objects that we returned were ceremonial dress mm -hmm. adornment. Some were very sacred objects. And they were all kind of made out of wood, stone, combinations of like feathers, bone, 
teeth from mm-hmm. animals and human hair oh, wow. and yeah and and bone i think i did a little bit of research beforehand as, as soon as i was kind of asked about this and the information i found it, it's quite a lot of it was from the perspective of the people the colonial people that actually took yeah, these of objects course. The, the museum was taking steps to limit access and, and t- actually took these items off display before I access got oh, in touch. Oh, that's interesting. Over the years, while they've been in the Manchester collections, I think they'd passed between various institutions within and around Manchester. They'd acquired various labels, stickers. As they know, do, uh, yeah. Tags. And so a majority of it was just kind of going through and removing those tags, removing those labels. Some, luckily, were just kind of tied on with string. Some even directly written on with, like, correction fluid, yeah. like Tipex. Marker pen and uh, ballpoint pen, I think, was uh, <laughs> one or two of them. The majority of it was sitting down in a partitioned-off part of the conservation studio and then a, a later an office and just slowly, mechanically removing what I could with scraping, mm-hmm. lifting, with micro spatulas and a magnifying glass to assist me in mm-hmm. certain parts. I did use solvents a little, but I soon found that most of the objects, they wouldn't really Mm -hmm. tolerate it because they were painted. In many ways, it's very similar to removing labels from books and uh, leather and such like. It's just that kind of carefulness. That's the interesting thing about conservation, isn't it? Because we're we're specialists, but we're all going to travel through a project treatment in the same manner. Well, another aspect of this is I couldn't really record what I was doing. Oh, I couldn't take photographs of the objects. No, of course. And I couldn't really create before and after photographs. I, I could write down and record these descriptions. But the other aspect of this is it was an unconditional repatriation mm. in the future use of these objects. For <laughs> It's none of my business. That that was, yeah. that was the key aspect of this. They have no obligation to tell me. And that's fine. Were you able to sort of yeah. to step away and think, no, actually, yeah, these this is their stuff and it's I don't have to care? Basically, yes. The main thing is it kind of kicks into your, well, I don't know about you, but as a conservator, it kind of kicks into that, oh, I'd just like to set it right again. I'd like to put it back to where it was, which we have to subdue and go, no, 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 that's an important part of its history. We need to keep that. And it allowed me to just kind of get on with it and just prepare those objects. The only thing I knew was that they had to take a flight around the world. So it was mostly just protecting them for that. that. That was the main thing. So... The people from IATSIS, so it was Chris Simpson is the director of this Return to Cultural Heritage project, and uh, the project research manager, Tamarind Mira, they both came over with representatives of the Gangalida Gawara nation, because this process, is, as far as I understand, uh, took about two years oh, to wow. all kind of come to fruition. Yeah. So I'll just mention a few people. Stephen Welsh, who's the uh, Deputy Head of Collections and Curator of Living Cultures at the Museum in Manchester. Susan Martin, who I mentioned before, Curatorial Assistant for Human Cultures. Gillian Smithson, who's the Registrar. Jenny Discombe, Eric Narkis, both conservators there. And Sam Beath, who's the Collection Care Manager. And also Esme Ward, who's the uh, Director of the Museum. And then they were dealing directly with Chris and Tamarind. Mangi Badajari Yan and Donald Bob, both from the Gangalida Gawara Nation, came over and they were the ones that were actually receiving the objects. This first stage, we went down to the storage room and that was when they were introduced to the items. They opened up the objects, they had a look, and then myself and Stephen left uh, Mangu and Uncle Donald in the room for about, I think it was about two hours, just so that they could be with the mm-hmm. objects and reawaken them. And they talked about it afterwards, about how you know they could sense the presence of these objects in the room and how the objects were kind of like in a dormant state. It was about waking up the object. They'd been removed from country, and there's these various kind of phrases they use, like back to country. Mm -hmm. from country and it was great terminology i thought and it was just about kind of reassuring the objects that they were about to go home i I sat outside and i spoke to chris from iatsis and he he told me about all the work that they've been doing these objects for the last 250 years have been absent from their cultures and then their cultures has dwindled Mm -hmm. through of colonization that's where the the work of iatsis is important it's it's allowing these objects to go back and be reused within the uh, the communities and re-spark and regenerate the cultural aspects related to them and i feel so grateful to chris and the various uh sorry they also had um, a national indigenous tv station had sent a crew along to document all this they were so 
passionate about being involved in this project. And even though they may not necessarily be related to the indigenous groups that were receiving objects back, it was a shared celebration that these items were coming back to country. People worry that what's going to be lost is the be all and end all. But the thing is, a lot of these collections just sat there and nobody actually necessarily understood. You know, they've been removed from their context. It does rely, obviously, on the work of a IATIS for people to look at these objects, recognize them, and then piece together where they came from and then marry them up with the people that maybe don't exist anymore or that exist in that region and may know something about it. But with that interaction and that level of cooperation, you learn more about what is in the collections and you realize what it means to go back to the people that should have it. The phrase that kind of got repeated was, we gain more than we lose. So it sounds like you had a really amazing experience. Yeah, I mean, I'd also say it was a, a real, it was a breath of fresh air, really. I always been working on this one specialism and this one generalized notion of conservation to step out of that and apply basic principles to something else yeah. was a real good experience and very interesting did you learn anything about the process of repatriation that you feel would be useful for others to know hmm I think it's just kind of keeping your mind open breaking that set in your ways or rather the established way of thinking that we know best we have storerooms full of objects which never really see the light of day Mm. it obviously depends on people's Mm -hmm. willingness to engage and see what the benefits are for all and i think if you can do that it's worthwhile well thank you very much mark for speaking to us about this thank you and uh, hopefully in the future i can speak to you about books (laughs) i know a bit more about those i think And we were also contacted, and I love this. I absolutely love this about our listeners and our fans. Um, We were contacted by Daniel, and he actually suggested repatriation as a as a topic when we'd already scheduled it in our last season because COVID got in the way, basically. And obviously, I jumped at this and said, "Yes, we are in the process of." trying to get one of these out yeah. <laughs> please talk to us so he I've, I've done an interview with him talking about his master's dissertation um, at Melbourne University about the conservation argument towards repatriation hi everyone so I'm here with Dan who's a graduate of the University of Melbourne his thesis was on something very interesting and topical to this episode Dan would you like to introduce yourself and the project that you were working on yeah, oh, hi, I'm Dan Schwartz. I'm a recent graduate of the University of Melbourne, the Graham White Center of Cultural Materials Conservation, and currently working in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm here on the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh peoples of the Coast Salish Nation, whose unceded territory I currently reside and work. Hi, Daniel. It's lovely to speak to you. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah, so you actually contacted us saying that this would be a really, really good episode topic, didn't you? And we, at the time, were secretly trying to get one together. So your email to us came at a very good time. So thank you for that. Could you introduce your topic, please, and tell us a bit about what inspired you to choose it? Yeah, uh, so I guess the easiest way to describe my topic is that I wanted to make a conservation-based argument for repatriation. I felt that uh, in the practice, we are kind of known as the naysayers in institutions that because of our focus on materials that we kind of forget everything else or we have a tendency or we are at least perceive to forget everything else that is involved in conservation and that that is used as an impetus for denying repatriation requests. I want conservation to be an active part in repatriation and the conversations that go on between institutions and source communities and for conservatives to be advocates for it, to understand that there is a great and deep impact that we can have on communities and on cultural heritage in general uh, by facilitating repatriation. Brilliant. And it sounds like such a huge topic as well. Yeah, it is a large topic that certainly can't be covered by a single thesis, unfortunately. And, you know, with my limited perspective as you know the person I am uh, my own personal identity I can't speak for anyone other than myself and so I really tried to create this as a conservation sided argument instead of trying to speak for indigenous communities who I think are very capable of speaking for themselves so that was your starting point where did you go from there what did you find out from that 
Well, I started as a really deep dive into the literature to see where the conversation was at the time. Uh, I started the research and really learned about the history of conservation, how it was formulated, and how those antecedents carry on today and create sticky areas for conservators when coming in contact with Indigenous communities and with uh, the topic of repatriation itself. And so I learned about the colonial roots of conservation, of how they were formulated at the height of the Enlightenment and how all of those kinds of scientifically minded ideas really focused conservation on materials, much to the exclusion of, of other considerations when talking about cultural heritage. Found out that there are many things that are both uh, facilitating and hindering repatriation coming from uh, the discourse in conservation, finding out that there are many international organizations and uh, multinational organizations uh, like UNESCO, like ICROM, like the IIC, and then our own national-based conservation institutions that use language to describe our practice as being mainly about the perpetuation of the physical material and not necessarily about the practices around cultural expression and the practice of creating uh, cultural materials. We need to refocus our approach to uh, at least create a better balance between conservation of materials and conservation of cultural practice and facilitating cultural continuity in Indigenous communities. How do you see your work fitting in with the modern day museum practice? Because obviously this is a goal that we um, should all share in museums to have uh, less colonial, um, more modern, um, more up to date attitude to this sort of um, to this sort of work. How do you see this fitting in with that? Well, it's really, I guess, attitudinal in nature. Uh, the argument I'm trying to make is just to come at it from the understanding is that we need to be weighing the benefits of our own institutions in holding on to materials collected in colonial context and what we want to do to decolonize our institutions, to decolonize our professions and ourselves and our own uh, lives by opening up those collections to uh, repatriation requests, to not be the naysayers, to be the ones who are actually saying, yes, this is, this is a good thing, not necessarily for the condition of the physical material, but for the condition of the communities that are making these requests understanding that they're part of something living, something that is dynamic and not static, and something that can be reinterpreted and reimagined inside these originating communities where they're very much potentially stifled in our Western colonial contexts. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge is that progress is being made, is that, you know, even since I was writing and researching my thesis, that places like ICOM are trying to uh, create new definitions of museums to facilitate these more open and dynamic, I'll use that word again, institutions that are respectful and open to these kinds of controversial topics, but also signifying that they see that there has been a gap, that there has been a, a lack of an ethic to facilitate these kinds of discussions and uh, interactions. So we have had a fair amount of controversy in the UK with um, certain museums that are pretty famous for uh, their colonial roots, let's say, <laughs> not to name any <laughs> names. Um, what would you say to people who come up against this quite hard and feel very uncomfortable with it as a topic? So I guess it comes back to a question of priorities. I can take a very pragmatic argument and just say is that we as cultural institutions are limited in our ability to do everything. We're limited in our funding. We're limited in our resources. We're limited in our space. And too often our are we just taking on collections that we can't take care of properly because we don't have those resources? And so participating in a system that allows us to let go of some of those things that we can't control is a way to uh, open up for new things so that we can't take on those other uh, collections that we may find interesting and, and new and relevant. Um, so that's a pragmatic uh, approach. The other one is definitely more conceptual and theoretical and focused on a social justice that talks about restorative practices in our field to help communities that are disadvantaged. And I think, you know, that's incredibly important in the current moment we're seeing across the world uh, mm -hmm. to say that it's not up to us to be the deciders. We constantly talk about ourselves as conservators, as curators, as museum professionals, being stewards of collections and not the actual owners of collections. And so it's time to start listening to the owners, the meaning makers of these materials so that we can better engage and be more ethical and be on the side of these communities as opposed to hurdles to their uh, achieving their goals. 
what are we here for, basically? Yeah, there's a there's a, a great quote from a conservative in the UK, uh, Dean Sully. He wrote a great uh, compendium. He edited a great compendium on pretty much a decolonizing conservation approach. And uh, one of his quotes is that repatriation claims often expose the internal contradictions of the heritage industry as they present the potential loss of raw materials for heritage scholarship and professional practice, which is kind of, I think, seen as the antithesis of what we do, is that we we don't want to lose things. And that's inherently a valiant and productive relationship we have to materials, is that we don't want them to be lost. But it's also built upon an idea that we can only keep things if we have them in our own contexts, inside the conservation system. If we have them inside a, a museum system or a heritage system based upon a, you know, in Western colonial enlightenment based idea of understanding things and it's time to privilege and prioritize different ways of knowing and different ways of understanding and different ways of preserving today i'm reviewing plundered skulls and stolen spirits by chip Cornwell. i'm reading the ebook version and this is the university of chicago press publication from 2017 I don't know why I expected this book, but I'm hooked from the very beginning. The writing is compelling and personal, so this isn't a dry or impersonal piece of literature. It'll leave you moved. I'm actually going to read you an abridged version of the introduction to set the scene. The narrow storage room at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is lined with steel cabinets stuffed with Indian skulls and the skeletal fragments of legs and ribs and hands. Each bone is labelled like a library book with a tracking number, wrapped in a coarse white muslin and packed in a cardboard box. Many times, native visitors have come here to speak with the dead, praying to their ancestors through songs and drumming, filling the room with the silk curls of burning sweet grass and offering to the spirits. But most days the room is silent and dark, The skeletons linger in a kind of purgatory, waiting for repatriation. Over the last 25 years, this room has slowly become vacant, the cabinets emptying shelf by shelf, like a cemetery in reverse. The bones have been going home. Only two employees at the Denver Museum have keys to the room. I am one of them. This summer day, I entered the room to send 26 people back to their graves. With two museum colleagues, I carried the bones from the storage room to a larger one nearby, concealed behind the Denver Museum's exhibit of Native American cultures. We begin unpacking them. The work proceeds methodically, purposefully, surgeons transplanting organs in the hushed gallery of an operating theatre. One co-worker notes the museum tracking numbers for each set of human remains. Another hands me the bones. I wrap them in a traditional blanket, decorated with geometric shapes in hues of reds and blues, and soft as feather down. Three Native Americans stand by, scrutinizing the macabre task unfolding before them. After all of the pine coffers are filled, one of the white-haired elders steps forward. He's dressed like a cowboy, but has the bearing of a high priest, full of quiet dignity. While chanting a muted prayer, he brushes the bones with a thick bundle of sage. He asks me to fasten the lids in place. The ancestral spirits have been stirred. He could become very sick. The elder says his word that we museum people, we non-Indians, have also endangered ourselves. I let him bless me with a fan of lustrous eagle feathers, which he graces across my face and the outline of my body. I want to prove I respect this medicine man, but his beliefs are not mine. I do not fear bones. I am an anthropologist and a museum curator, trained to balance curiosity about religion with science cold view The human remains are only devices for decoding history. For me, bones are no different from shards of pottery to be pieced back into beautiful vases. But I know for these Native American traditionalists, the bones in the boxes are pulsating with power. For them, the dead are not really dead at all. The museum's collection has interrupted the natural order of the world, threatening the health of the living and the spiritual journeys of the ancestors. My museum has unleashed a chaos that only might be contained if the remains are returned to the earth. For them, repatriation is a religious duty, not a political victory. All of these Native Americans did not ask for their ancestors to be excavated. They have accepted the burden of reburial to become my museum's reluctant undertakers. The 
book is divided into several sections. The first is named Resistance, and then if we get to know the seedy underbelly of collecting. We meet various collectors, examine the Euro-American ideals that led to some really spectacular colonial hoarding, and explore the origins of the Denver Museum's collection. We get to know the long and hard history of Native American repatriation requests in the US, and how museums often treated any requests as a crisis. In the second part, called Regret, we read about the massacres, the intense emotions human remains can bring out in us, and the beginning of Nagpra. We hear about the opposition and the lobbying, and I'll freely admit that this section made me weep. It's an intensely emotional read because it's inhuman in many ways. In it, reburial is compared to book burning. Not by the author, of course, but by people who opposed the repatriation laws in America. And it's astonishing to think about. The third section of the book is called Reluctance. And in it, we unpack beliefs around ownership, whether selling something under duress is legitimate, and the unfortunate belief amongst museums that there's such a thing as no take backsies. I like this chapter because it deals with a lot of the difficulties that museums need to reckon with. How did we acquire the things that we have? Is it okay because someone sold something to us when they were desperate? Or is it actually our responsibility to look at the ways we acquired things and decide that actually we need to be better than that? It's definitely a section that poses some really worthwhile questions and ones that we've definitely discussed in this episode already. The fourth and final section of the book is called Respect. And in it, the author ties together their own experiences and the stories of people who have fought for repatriation and who have fought for Nagpra to become a real thing. And it's a section of the book that has an air of mixed resignation and hope. And it's intensely emotional, just like the whole book is. It leaves you moved, and I would recommend it to any museum professional and probably any American I'm surprised by how much I enjoyed this book. Enjoyed is perhaps the wrong word because it was it was a really raw read and it's one that should leave you with a lot of emotions and thoughts. It's extremely well written. I really enjoyed it. By its very nature, it is of course a book steeped in North American history, but it throws tendrils into adjacent European museums as well. If you fancy giving it a go, it's available from the University of Chicago Press for between 19 and $30. It's also available on Amazon in the UK for anywhere between 13 and £20. The book has 360 pages and uh, it's filled with emotions. And I hope you take the time to read it. Thanks for listening. If you're enjoying The C Word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisements. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. That's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. Thanks for listening. With the C word, and you'll be listening to Marina Dialekan, Jeremy Uden, Chloe Rumsey, and me, Jenna Mathiason. Join us next time for a Halloween special!
meantime, you can check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the Seaword Podcast, or simply email us on theseawordpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Didi Music, used under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production. I had a thought there somewhere and it fell out of my head because I was too emotionally moved. (laughs) Good job, brain.